So you're a dentist, eh? You're in the right place. This is the Canadian Dentist Podcast with Dr. Carlo Biasucci, where you'll get a truly Canadian approach to building a low-stress, highly profitable practice and live life on your terms. Learn more at theelitepractice.com. So I'm taking holidays. What should I do with hygiene? Yeah, okay. So it's approaching <clears throat> summer holidays now. It's a good time to talk about this question. It so is. <laughs> what do I do if I want to take some holiday time? Well, first of all, you should take some holiday time. Uh, most people haven't had a vacation probably in a year, <laughs> unfortunately, with the pandemic. So I would say, and what I have always done, is hygiene runs anyway. Now, I know that hygiene will be off, on, off, on. We're all going to take holidays over summer. But when the dentist isn't there, hygiene runs. Hygiene runs, again, we just covered this, following the system. Present treatment. Take photos. Use the five screenings process. You know, Mrs. Jones, I have this picture up here. You can see this situation with this tooth. I've been working with Dr. Smith for a long time. I've seen, I don't know how many times, thousand times where he has recommended this for that. I want to go ahead and get this on the books because his schedule is going to be really busy when he comes back from holidays. And I will show him this picture. I will email it to him. I will make sure that he reviews it. And if there's any question about what I'm saying, he will call you. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get it in the schedule. And in the meantime, please make sure that you don't bite hard on this tooth because it could break and blah, 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 right? But we teach in case acceptance. Right. But do that. If hygiene's running just picking teeth the whole time, you're going to end up with a break even week. Which is not the end of the world, but I would I would be much happier with a break-even week and a lot of production when I get back. Because then I didn't take anything off. I didn't lose anything. Exactly. Right? I still got the same net result. I just pushed it ahead a little bit. Now, I know in dentistry, you're not going to get the time back. If you're the primary producer, then that money kind of just got pushed away from you a little. But it's coming. Right. Right? You could work a couple of extra days the next month and make it all back and have no loss. So, I don't know. You can do what you want with that but in terms of your scheduling. But... Absolutely, I would not let those patients come through recall and not recommend anything because you're not there. Now, obviously they can't diagnose, but they can recommend and say, I'm going to have the doctor look at this and confirm it, but let's get it scheduled because I have seen this a thousand times working for Dr. Smith. This is what he will recommend. So let's just do it, right? And I would proceed as normal. I would proceed as, as normal. If you have an associate with the associate, you can do the hygiene checks. That's fine. If you don't, just have the hygiene run like that. Right. And if the hygienist says, I think I found decay here or here, they will just send you the information or leave you a list or however your process is. And you will approve, not approve, yes, no, whatever. If they take an x rays and photos, you can tell them, yeah, book Mrs. Jones in for these four fillings. And then the hygienist will give them a quick call and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, guess what? Dr. Smith looked at your x rays and said, this is what he found and wants to book you in for a one hour appointment, I'm gonna pass you over here to Mary who's gonna schedule you. Simple, don't lose the production. Yeah, absolutely not. Yep, that's so we always, always kept the lights on. The last probably five or six years, we never took a complete practice shutdown, right? We never did yeah. for a long time. Maybe it was longer than that, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Alrighty, so now I'm gonna to go to um, team leader meetings. So how important are regular team leader meetings? I know everybody's busy and schedules are busy and everything like that, but... Can we skip a meeting? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no. So the rule of thumb is the more you meet, the more you make, <clears throat> basically. Why? Because we don't have enough communication, period. That's it. Like, so if, if you spend the time to fine tune it, this is like, okay, I literally two weeks ago, I, I cut a, and split a bunch of wood, firewood. I, I like having a wood stove in the wintertime. I spent some time sharpening the chainsaw chain before I started. You know why? Because it takes like seconds to cut through a very large log with a sharp chain. It'll take you forever vibrating away on the thing with a dull chain. You won't get through it. Right. Okay. Team, same thing. If I have a team that produces, you know, at a seven out of 10, and I spend the time calibrating them, coaching them, 
teaching them, leveling them up, and they can now produce just a little bit more. And I get them to a 7.5 out of 10 with the meeting. I burned an hour and a half of productive time, but I gained an extra 0.5 out of 10. Productively, whatever I lost in that hour, I will make it up many fold over the next month. But it's not just the next month, it's the next months, years, etc. that my team now has a new standard. Don't skip meetings. I don't care what you talk about. If the people, even if the energy is just better than it was, Maybe they didn't learn a new skill, but just a little bit happier. There's a little more pep in their step. You will be more productive. You know how quickly you walk into a business and you can tell what the atmosphere of that business is, what the culture is. You can tell when you walk in the door, you can so feel it. Let alone when you look at the first person at the desk. Do they look at you? Do they look down? Do they look like you're an interruption? Like you got you within seconds, you know, Okay. How much more of a difference does it make when your team has a, even a small increase in energy? What's huge. Case acceptance starts when, right? The phone call, the first point of contact, and it can be killed by anyone on the team that person it comes into contact with that is off brand with the rest. So even if the whole team is phenomenal and your stereo person is having a bad day, and they're, they throw something in the sterilization area and it bangs and you can hear it through the whole office. The patient's going to be like, huh, that's off brand. Something doesn't fit. And the radar goes up. And then it's like, hmm, you know, what's going on? Or they catch an untoward conversation or someone looks like they're pouting, but everyone else is having a great day. And one person just looks off brand. That's going to hurt. Right. So you got to take that time to calibrate, level up, grow your whole team as a, as a group. If you don't, then... That's just one person as one example. If the whole team is working at a lower level than they could, or they're all stressed out, burned out, exhausted, it's going to hurt. How do you fix that? Well, you can't make dentistry any less high paced than it is. It's a busy, like a dental office is a busy place. But if everyone is in it together and feels like everyone's got my back, they'll do it. They'll do what they got to do. Everyone will just pull together and get it done. Right? So, the meetings are where that stuff happens. It's not, we didn't go through our agenda. I mean, the agenda is one of the things to do, keep the meeting on track. But the primary purpose of meetings is rapport building with your team. It's bonding. It's everyone getting a little bit of input so that they can feel like I see it. I see eye to eye with my, my coworkers. Right. It's psychology more than anything. People want to be together. It's an important way to break gossip. If you don't give them anything to talk about, they're going to come up with stuff to talk about. Right. Do I want them to come up with their own stuff to talk about or I want them to talk about my stuff? Right? So when we had team leader meetings, I didn't come to them all. But I came to many with something to talk about, specific and intentional. And it wasn't just like, you know, the weather or this person or that person. It was, here's a really cool thing I learned that I think you guys will find helpful whether it be in the office or in your personal life. You know, here's the thing I, I read. Here's the thing I saw, right? I gave you something that, two days ago that I read that I thought this would be perfect for Christine and what she's doing, right? So I'm always looking for what can I do for my team that can help them be better at what they do. Right. And see, that thing that I gave you to read, I don't know if you read it yet, you don't have to tell me, but it will not only help you in your work role, it's a personal life uh, improvement awesome. that will help you in your interactions with people in general, even with your kids. So I thought, see, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. It's not just, hey, you know, how can I make sure that you produce more? If I can grow a person to be a better person, they will produce more by just by by default, right? Right. So it's don't true. skip the team leader meetings. Don't skip any meetings if you can, because it's it's you're taking time away from growing your team. Period. Okay, that's too long of an answer. Go ahead. No, that's perfect. Um, what is the role of a team leader? Okay. <clears throat> so there is a good video about this specifically in the team-driven practice that talks about this. But I'll just give you the real quick recap. Um, a team leader is someone who is entrusted with 
helping you to reach goals. They are not a person who is now been given superior authority over anyone else who is responsible for HR issues or policing other team members. They are a person who is helping you to grow your team, to train other team members, to, um, to communicate your vision through the team, and basically to help you reach goals. That's, that's what a team leader does. So expectations of a team leader, the way we talk about it in team driven practice, would be, you know, I would want them to take what they learn at a team leader meeting and explain it and teach it to their team, to the rest of their team. So if I have a hygienist and we talk about, okay, we wanna implement something in hygiene. Okay, I'm gonna do that with the hygiene team. So we're gonna have a little hygiene meeting and I'm gonna teach them what we just talked about. And they're gonna say, hey, okay, here's what Dr. Smith would like us to talk about and here's where the resources are and let's go through that. So they would go through with the team, level them up, they would um, explain anything that is necessary in terms of changes in systems or new systems. They would, in some cases, I would have them do team development interviews depending on how much tenure they had with me. So if they were a newer hygiene, if you had a newer team, you can't have like a two-year staff member doing a team development interview with a one-and-a-half-year staff member. Right. But if you have someone who's been with you for like eight years, and a new staff member comes on, they can do a team, develop, a team uh, development interview with them and set some goals and help them to kind of achieve those goals, right? That person is also really going to be monitoring statistics. So how will they help you achieve goals? Implementing stuff, but also monitoring the results. So all of the hygiene team would give their statistics, their daily production numbers, et cetera, to the team lead. The team lead would pass it on to the clinic lead or the office manager, whatever you want to call them and then that would get reported to the doctor, right? So you would have that sort of back and forth communication. That's it in a nutshell. Am I missing anything? No, you're actually good because you're answering more questions than I'm asking here. Like oh. I have a couple, <laughs> you did a couple at a time. So I'm talking too much, okay. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. <laughs> How do you pass control on of major tasks and decisions to your team leaders? Like if you had a major thing that you typically do, how do you pass those things on? Okay, what's an example? Hmm. I want to, I'm going to give you the right answer. I don't know, like hiring or... Okay, so you want to delegate a, a significant role, I understand. Yeah. Well, it depends. It depends on... Well, it depends more on how you present it than anything. Because it's not like... A hiring process is just a process. You're just teaching them a system, right? So you have to sell it in a way where the other person accepts it. You can't just... You know, the worst way to do it. Okay, so I have, we have given you the project vision um, worksheet to work through when you're delegating. Okay, you don't want to take that as a, like you're giving someone a speeding ticket, you know, like this is, this is what you're going to do. Sign it. You know? No, no, no. <laughs> it's a thought exercise, right? I want you to think through that sheet to understand how important is this if I get it right? How important is it if I get it wrong? And communicate that with some heart. Like, if the person understand, like, there is a system. If you follow the system, we will get this result. If you don't follow the system, then you have to work with people that you don't like. And our patients will not want to come back. And our workplace is going to change from an awesome, happy workplace into a place that we don't want to go, we don't want to show up to anymore. And you're going to have to find another job. You're going to have to start over again. It, Right? I would take it all the way down there for people so they understand this is an important thing. Now, it's really simple though. Here are the steps you have to follow. Here's the, in this case, here's the binder. Do this, right? Or here's Christine, call her and ask, right? Or you know, whatever, like here's the process, but ex clearly explain the process. <clears throat> so I would approach a person and say, you know, okay, Sally, I am looking for someone to help take on a really important job and I thought you would be the perfect fit for this. If you don't want to do it, just let me know. But I thought you would be perfect for this and, and you're the first person that came to mind. Here's what I'm looking at. And I would explain it. 
When you say that, is the person going to say no? Sometimes, but not often, right? That makes them feel good. Yeah, you're trusting them. So you, when you're when you're giving someone a task that is important, you also have to give them your trust. Right. You actually have to give them your trust, but you also have to make sure they feel like you've given them your trust. It's, it's not mutually exclusive. Like you can't just make them feel like it, but then you don't really trust them because they'll know. In the project vision, there is a feedback process, right? There is a way where if I, you know, if I'm giving you this task, I also want you to let me know how things are going every so often, and this is how we're gonna do it. So it's like I'm trusting you, but I'm looking for verification. So I'm I'm building into the system a way to check over your shoulder, but I'm letting you do what you gotta do in the meantime. So you really are trusting them, but you're just monitoring, right? You're giving them enough guardrails. It's like with a child, as they get older, you can let them do more and more things, but you also have to keep an eye to make sure they're not burning the house down while they're doing the new thing, right? <laughs> so that's how I would do it, right? You're monitoring. Okay, you're gonna do these things, but you know, let me know how it's going. Give me some feedback. Show me this, show me that when you've got it, right? Go come up with the new whatever, but then show it to me. I wanna see it, right? So you're an excited participant in the process, but you're really letting them do it all, right? That's how I would look at it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, now, Era has to, she has a question here she wants me to ask you. Okay. And this, these, by the <laughs> way, are not rehearsed. I have no idea what she's going to ask me. So <laughs> she wanted to know who your two favorite employees were at the dental office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's, you're not going to like the answer. But, uh, yeah. No, my two favorite employees. Well, here's the thing, right? So, favorite employees. What makes a long-term employee? This is, this is the question you're asking me, maybe. Well, I mean, obviously, you guys still work for me, so that's that's helpful. Um, what makes a long-term employee? And that's that's a question I think is worth discussing. But yes, I will answer your question and say you and Aaron definitely were <laughs> my favorite employees. You know, what makes a long-term employee? Well, someone who grows as you grow, who has more than a, who does not have a me only mentality, right? Someone who had, by the way, that makes a successful business owner too. If you're only concerned about your own growth, your own, what can I get? How can I benefit? If you're only looking for the I and everything, you will not be successful as a business owner and you will not have long-term team members. Right. Remember that people like people like them, right? People attract those who think and act and feel the way they do. So if you naturally care about people, but you also care about results, you will find people like that over time. They will gravitate to you. They're the ones that will cross these. I've had many employees cross my path that they came and they went and it was not an issue. But some cross my path and they stick. There's magnetism when people think the same way, not just on one level, but on many levels. And it's interesting because as we have, you have worked with me now for, I don't even know, is it 14 years, 15 years? Who even knows? It's been around there, yeah. I stopped counting. <laughs> and Era is, is pushing 10 years, is she more than 10 years now? She's about that, for sure. Yeah, so, you know, we have personal conversations, like not work related, just general conversation. And more than just our work philosophy is in common, right? The way we think about many things is similar. Right. right. So you you just resonate with people that are like you. So by the way, that also applies if you don't like who you have around you, right? <laughs> so if you don't like your team or your team is, you know, whatever description you want to give them that isn't great or flattering, then that's a reflection of what you're putting out there. So I would say that the long-term employee is drawn to you because of who you are. Do you, and the biggest one of all, it's like, do what you say you will do. If you have a track record of doing that, then people trust you. Right. So first of all, there is the opportunity to have long-term staff. They don't trust you, they're gonna stick around. They're gonna find someone else, especially when you know, you're competing on pay and all these things. Like trust is kind of like the, the most important, um, underrated, not discussed issue in keeping team members. Same with keeping patients, by the way, right? So. Most dentists will spend exorbitant amounts of time and money 
growing themselves, reading books, studying, how can I be better at this? How can I be better as a leader? How can I do all these things? And they grow themselves, but they don't think to grow their team. Mm -hmm. They don't take the team along, right? You have been to most courses that I've been to. Exactly. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Like I'm thinking all the way back from way back when we started working together. You have been to most of the courses I have been to. Clinical, non-clinical, leadership, whatever. When I was just talking about the team leader meetings, right? I said I would always bring, when if I was in a mastermind group of some sort or I was learning something, I would always share those things. Because if I was excited about an area of growth that I was growing in it and I found that it was making a big difference in my life, I wanted to share it with people. I would share it with my team. Right. Well, where do I spend more of my waking hours than anywhere else, right? Spend more time with your team than you do with your family. So you want to share those things. And so I would bring them and I would share them. And that grows everybody together. That's the foundation for having long-term staff, long-term team members that you can rely on and trust. Right. Now, does that mean that people don't change or whatever? Yeah. It, it happens, but if you're growing together, then all of the changes that happen, a barring that, you know, maybe, maybe what, you know, if a person literally moves physically away from your location, well, then they don't work with you anymore. Fine, but that's not that common. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a, an excuse that they give you and then they go somewhere else, right? So, it, yes, it should be a goal to try to retain people, but it shouldn't be a stretch. If you have to bend over backwards to try to retain people, then you're trying too hard. Right. And there's also something that you might need to fix internally. Right? The first place I always go, see, not when I started though. When I started, I was not a good leader at all. But now I can tell you the first place that I would go, even in the last five or 10 years, the first place I would go when there's a problem is, am I doing something wrong here? Am I wrong? Because if I'm wrong, then the first thing needs to happen is I need to apologize. I need to fix that. Because mm -hmm. I can't, the worst thing you can do is just, you know, throw your hands up and then get, and it becomes a, a war over nothing. It's just a matter of, you're just butting heads for the sake of butting heads. But if I have a problem with a team member, especially a longer term team member, I would first look at where am I going wrong? If I'm not going wrong, then where did I leave this relationship hanging somewhere? Where did I take a turn, you know, on a, the, you know, came to a fork in the road and I went this way and they went that way? What happened? And can I go back and, and close the gap? And if I can't, then I can't. But if I'm conscious about it all the way along and I know that I'm at a fork in the road, I want to consciously spend some time with that, with those long-term people and say, hey, you know, here's a direction. I think we should look at it. Right. What do you think? Where, where are you at this? Or, you know, here's why I agree. So we've had some business changes over the last few years, right? No question. We've, we've moved out of the practice. We've moved into a new business, full, full speed, full force. We are looking at uh, other things now on the horizon. Um, not that elite practice is going anywhere, by the way, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, but there are always, there's always something that we're working on, right? So, before we, I, you know, I, I entertain any of those other directions, we have had conversations about this. Hey, you know, this is where I think things are going. I, I'm looking at this direction. And so, you know, you take people along for the ride and, and you trust them as being able to have those conversations and you frame them in a way that, you know, you, people understand you really are trying to like have their best interests in mind and there is future potential growth for you. And I'm looking out for that. And, you know, so you're just, you're just trying to be a, you know, a mentor to your people, not not that you need to be mentoring people, but I'm just saying, you know, you're, you're trying to share your growth, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yep. It's because over time, we all grow and we all change. And by the way, this will apply to your personal life too, right? If you're growing and changing and, and doing all kinds of things in your business life, and then you come home and your spouse is not doing any of that, you're going to notice a big difference. You got to take them along for the ride. Yep. It's a huge thing. I mean, I, I know that from my own personal life too where I grew and changed really fast and then I had to like stop and like catch up at home, you know? And, and it's the same thing with team. Like, you know, when we doubled in a year and I tell the story, we lost 19 people in six months because I grew and changed too fast and I didn't bring my team along. Right. And we had, we did it all backwards, right? But then we came up with the process to fix it and we 
from then on, we have gotten it more or less right. right? We didn't have anywhere near that many people quit over the next six years. Exactly. Right? We, we didn't have that problem anymore. It went away because we stopped and we really assessed what did we do wrong here? Oh, we went left and they went right. <laughs> we kind of made a mistake. Yeah. So we had unrealistic expectations. We did, you know, we didn't stop to backfill in the, the, the gap in knowledge. We weren't growing the people along with the speed of the practice. They were coming from, <clears throat> you know, mom and pa dental care and we were running totally different operation to everyone else around us. Right. So they thought, oh, it's this new practice. It's exciting. Everyone's going there. It's so great. Let's go see. And they come in and get chewed up and spit out by the machine and be like, what happened? Like <laughs> two weeks later, my head spinning on the sidewalk. I didn't get, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, that was our fault, right? So then we got it right. So take your people along for the ride. That's, that's huge. And it, and it applies at home as well, right? Don't grow in a vacuum. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. This one here, you already touched on it a little bit, but maybe a little bit more. What is the value of implementing the practice growth challenges, like all of them? Dollar value? Dollar value, yeah, pretty much. Oh, it's huge. You can double the practice with that. Yeah. You can double an average practice with those. No question. The people that are regularly sending us the tracking, like on a month-to-month -month basis for all of them, it's, it's remarkable. It's... So That's I had an huge. office tell me last week they implemented the practice growth challenge after much nagging on our end, just the <laughs> fluoride and yeah. had an extra $10,000 that month. It's huge. $10,000, new profit, just stone cold profit in the bank just because they finally implemented it. Yep. Okay. That was only the first month. That'll be a whole year's worth of production in 12 months, $120,000, even if it's a hundred thousand. $100,000 for the same day of work, the same people, the same everything. Yeah. So if I'm worried about my overhead. That's where it is. You know, where that's one. There's seven. You know what I mean? That's and so you true. can double the practice just with that. Yep. Just with those things. And then there's the rest. Like, come on. You know, it's the value of those is huge. And that's why we design them that way. It's the reason why we still mail them one a month or every other month or whatever we're doing. Physically, because yeah, you have access to them on the platform. Yes, we prompt you to do them. We tell you, please do this one. Please do this one. Then we send them to you by mail. So they literally end up on your desk because I want you them to be like inconveniently in your way and reminding you because they're that important, right? Yes, they're huge. Now, communication amongst the team. So who does the team go to with questions and concerns and why is it harmful to bring questions and concerns, issues directly to the doctor? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so this has got a bit of a packing to do, but okay. First off, let's look at the hierarchy that we set up. Questions, concerns, issues, anything that is not to do with the immediate care of a patient that the doctor has to make a decision on right now goes through the team process, the team lead process. So I go to my team leader. If my team leader cannot decide or make or come up with a solution, go to the clinic leader, office manager. If that person cannot decide, then they will go to the doctor, but only until they have calibrated those things. Once that person has asked the doctor that question, then forevermore that person does not need to ask the doctor that question anymore, which means that question should only be asked once of the doctor and then forever more handled by the, the, the team, the clinic lead, right? Right. So there's a calibration period, which I don't want to skip over, but once that has happened, the team doesn't need to go to the doctor ever, really. <clears throat> okay. Hygienist, patient Smith, does he need, you know, didn't take his pre-med or he's supposed to, okay, fine. The doctor needs to know that, but everything else, can I have Friday off? You know, I want to raise, I need new scalers, whatever the nonsense is, goes to the team. Okay. Now, the biggest reason why is because the doctor is trying to run a productive day. The doctor is also juggling 10 things in their mind. Like usually I would, I just, I'll use my own example. I've got a patient in two different rooms, <clears throat> sometimes in three. I've got hygiene checks I've got to do. I've got all of these things in my head right now. 
every time someone comes to me, it, it pulls me away from it. Mm-hmm. And I have to go back and put all that stuff in my head. Or I have to try to answer their question with that little tiny bit of bandwidth that's left. And you know what happens when you do that? Because we did this one time. I remember we checked. It was 13 times in the morning. I think it was in the morning. That I was interrupted for stuff that didn't need, my, didn't need me to answer. Someone else could have answered it. Right. Okay, 13 times. So 26 times in a day. Okay, I would be interrupted for stuff that, that anybody else could have answered. Okay, other people on the team could have answered that. So what happens is after number five, six, ten, is that little bit of bandwidth becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And I get more and more irritated because if I spend a half a minute with each person, I spend 15 minutes. If I spend a minute with each person, I've lost a half an hour. Right. So I would be, I would undoubtedly come across to, to team members as short, right? Oh, he's grumpy today. He doesn't have time to talk to you. <laughs> Look at the schedule. Yeah. And you want to talk about nonsense. And you, like, it's a rude if you start a conversation with a person and you, and you don't like converse with them a little bit. Like, you know, what do you want? Okay, bye. Like, <clears throat> I was like that, right? But I didn't have time because I had to literally run. Like, there, I'm like, I'm walking to room 17. Walk with me. It's so true. You know, if you can tell me on the way before I get there, I will answer you, right? That's not <clears throat> how you want to do it. Have the time, like have them go to the team leads and they would answer all the questions. No problem. Then when you talk to them, it's friendly with the patients and that sort of thing. And, you know, outside of patient care time or it's at meetings, which is really important to have, which we kind of talked about. <laughs> part of this is exactly this, bonding with your team. It's getting them, letting them talk to you outside of clinic time. <clears throat> And showing them that you're a person with a life and you're normal, you know. So I never had really downtime, like to, to say that I was just sitting around and we just like chat. That that didn't happen. That wasn't that wasn't a thing we did. <laughs> no, right? it never was. So that's that's the most important reason why, because you don't have time to deal with that stuff. Then what happens is the other thing, the worst thing is they bring you stuff that you can't deal with, but it irritates you, and now. You got that buzzing around in there with all the other stuff, okay? <clears throat> this is the office manager who keeps telling you all the nonsense that's going on in the office and the, the gossip and the, 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 the bickering between the team members and stuff that you don't need to know. Because if you do, it irritates you. And after the third thing you hear in a day, your demeanor is changed irreversibly for the day. Now, it's going to affect your case acceptance, it's going to affect your shortness with people on the team right. it's going to affect how you you dress the new patient it's going to affect your enjoyment of your job it's going to affect even when you go home you're going to be teed off all day and that might happen by 9 a.m yeah not necessary i don't want to know so we had a rule we tried to have a rule <laughs> i don't want to know <laughs> don't tell me yeah don't tell me anything that here are the categories where I get irritated. I don't yeah. want to know about gossip. I don't want to know about team bickering. I don't want to know about anything. Who's pissed off, whatever. Unless it needs my decision now, I don't want to know about it. Summary email, end of day. I don't want emotion. I don't want to talk about it any more than necessary. That's it. Send me a summary email. Even now, <clears throat> right? If I've stopped by the office and, you know, I know I don't have time to talk. I don't want to be rude. I will say, I have one minute. I have to go. I have an appointment. I'm on my way to something. Yep. If you can't finish it in a minute, please send me an email or we can talk later at another time that we will set by phone. But I won't be rude and say, start the conversation. And I'm sitting there like, you know, I got to go. I got to go. Like, don't start the conversation then. No. Right? Just be upfront. So have parameters like that. I think that's really important to do with people because you want to be respectful of people. You want to be friendly with people. You want them, if you want long-term team members, you have to treat them like in a way where they actually want to be around you a long time. <laughs> you know, like if, you're, if they don't, then you know that's on you. But see, the nature of dentistry is not that it's the dentist's fault. It's the nature of the business itself. You're the primary everything guy or girl. So it's hard to do that, right? It's not intuitive. You don't, 
you know, when you start in practice, you're just trying to do bigger, faster, better, more. And that's the whole existence for some folks. Right. The whole point of what we do and why you get involved with us is to leverage that, to make it enjoyable to do the thing you're going to do and optimally make it more productive, make it easier than it would be way, way easier without us. Right. So that you can still have a team be productive, even in this economy. It doesn't matter what the economy is doing. Right. Right. So that's how I look at it. That's perfect. Okay. Um, what is the best way to get maximum results from the program? I know we've touched a bit meetings, practice growth challenges. I think we've, but do you have anything to add to that one? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. You knew I would. I knew you would. <laughs> so the best way to get results from the program, in addition to having the time. Okay. So first of all, you have to engage with my team. Okay. So if they're not, if the, yes. if the member's not talking to you guys, then I don't know who they're talking to probably still themselves or their team and that's where they, that's what got them where they are okay then then you know if you engage with us and you don't talk to us well you know if i you know and then there's like i have monthly private calls with all of our members who are successful right. the ones i don't talk to i look at their numbers yeah. i know why they're not getting the, you know the results they should be getting we're not engaging Right. Right. If you're not engaging, you're not going to get results. This is not a like, you know, we're not going to do to send this to you by osmosis. This is not like, you know, it's like buying a CEREC and expecting you're going to make money with the CEREC. No, you got to use it. First of all, you got to be trained on it. And then you got to actually use the thing. And then you got to like, you know, make it a process in the office or iTero or any other piece of equipment. Right. Right. If you're going to engage with us, our business is knowledge so your part of the deal as a member is downloading the knowledge and implementing it so implementation is critical back to skipping team meetings the slower you move the slower you you get results if you don't have team meetings you don't implement the ones that my favorite are i don't have time for any of this i don't have time for that i don't have time for that you don't have time to do anything different than you're doing now. So this isn't a fit. This is the way those conversations go. Because a year from now, we're gonna have the same conversation. You're gonna blame me for not getting results. Right. If you do nothing, how do you expect to get results? It's not possible. That's true. Right? That happens here and there. We sometimes mistakenly let someone through the door and this is that's the situation you have. Right. Well, hey, you know, we had the conversation on the front end. Here's the expectation. You got to spend 90 minutes a week with your team. You got to go through the material. You got to implement stuff. You got to talk with my team. Now, you don't have to physically talk to my team, but your team has to talk to my team. So we get some momentum, right? right? I got to talk to you once a month for half an hour. If you can't spare that, you're lost. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not because I got nothing to do. Like, trust me, I'm okay if they don't call me. No problem. But it's not helping them. Right? Right? At the end of the day, the people who are getting results are doing all of those things. And when they have gone through the program, they are going through it again and again and again. Yeah. And they're getting more and more out of it every time. 100%. So the person who says, well, you know, I've got so much to work on. It'll take me forever to, to get through it all. So we're just going to like coast on this for a while. You know what's going to happen? They've got knowledge but they don't have execution. Right. It's like I bought a whole set of books and I put them over there on a the shelf. So I have all the knowledge now. I don't need you anymore. The problem is, is the knowledge was there before. The problem is execution and implementation. That's what we do. Right. Right. The point of engaging with our team is execution and implementation. The number one thing I do, the only thing I do on my private calls is I give the person the next one or two things that are the most important thing for them to do right now. And for those who have those calls, know how important it is to have those things. Because if you just did that one thing or those two things and nothing else for the next month, you would be significantly more successful than you are now. Right? You would move the needle that much faster. Right. So that is the point. And the same thing that you do with team when you're talking to them on a bi-weekly basis or whatever cadence you have with them is if they're spending the time just doing one thing at a time, just implement one thing, then we, by the end of the year, have implemented like 
25, 30 things. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. That is. Right? If we on private calls, you know, if I have done with members 12 to 24 really important, most important things to do, by the end of a year, we have moved some mountains. Exactly. Right? So, because when you start, you look at the program and it's like this big wall of, oh my goodness, buffet, all you can eat, what do I do? <laughs> and I'm just saying, no, 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 hang on a sec. You know, based on where you are, you want to start here, do this, do this. Skip that, but then do this. This is the most important thing you need right now. And without that guidance, yes, I mean, there's a natural cadence. You can go through the whole thing and you will still be successful. We do have people that do that, that they've been, they've been in our program for years and, and I've never actually talked to them, some of them. Right. But they're getting results because they're the kind of person that just learns their own way. I was like that in programs. Right. And I, I, I've dealt with some consultants in the past and... You know, even to this day, like, you know, I, um, a couple of mastermind groups, Dan Kennedy's groups, that kind of thing. Like I never, I wasn't a high engagement, go to every meeting kind of guy, but I took the material and I had a, a, a way where I would take it, dissect it, implement, delegate. I just had a process and it worked. Mm -hmm. But for the person who is, who is coming to us because they don't have that process, and they don't engage with us to get that process, then nothing's going to change for them, right? right? So that's the bottom line. That's awesome. Um, why is it so important to wow a new patient? You start on the touch points and everything like that, but what comes out of new patients? And Well, that's the thing, right? So when are people <laughs> most likely to refer? Within the first couple of days of joining a new practice or any business for that matter, right? The mo they're most likely to recommend a thing when they are new to the thing. This applies to everything, right. okay? So if I buy a new pickup truck, I buy a Ford pickup, I'm most likely to recommend a Ford pickup to people in the first month right. that I have that truck. Or dentist, or I don't know, whatever, pick your business. So if I don't wow the new patient, then I have lost the referral opportunity, okay? Yes, people will refer over time. Yes, you will get referrals you know, later on in the, in the relationship and such, but it generally comes from the initial engagement. Why? Because when a person is going to a new dentist, they tend to kind of talk about that. I'm going to try out this new dentist or they've already researched or who do you recommend? And someone's recommended them to come to you. So that person is going to ask how to go, right? Now that's that's the referral side of it. So you, if you don't wow them and they come back, oh my god, it was so much better than you said, right? And they come and they, where where is that? Where'd you go? Oh, really? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. So then it creates a buzz, right? Especially that happens in the workplace. That's huge. Yes. Right. So there's the whole new patient process. If they have a great experience, obviously you will have an easier time with case acceptance. You will have an easier time getting the whole family to come. So it will rapidly increase case acceptance, new patient flow. And then if you follow the, the process and you uh, thank them for referrals and you send them gifts and such, the things that we teach in the new patient process, it just keeps adding fuel to the fire. Right. So I think that is really important to consider that all the way through the process, there is the opportunity to blow it, right? Because if you have a, a, a five-star experience all the way along and then they hit a, a two-star employee, or a two-star problem, now you got now you got an issue. Right. Well, how am I going to deal with that? Right. So, like you have certain things. It, it's I, I refer to it as a stage production, right? It's um. You know, if I if you go watch a show, say you're watching a Broadway production, everyone's in a certain costume, and then some guy rolls out in a t-shirt and jeans and messy hair, and is like, you know, it's like stumbling through the lines, like, what? Is this part of the show? <laughs> This guy just stumbled into the back door. <laughs> what happened? Right. Right. Everyone in, is in uniform. Everyone is, you know, like stage production, right? The, one of the key things that we would do as a leadership group, team was to make sure that everything was on brand. Like one of the key roles of, of a team lead in, um, in the training process, we had to listen outside the door, let's say for a hygienist or an assistant who's being left alone with a patient early in their in their their work with us 
listen outside the door. What's happening in there? What are they saying? Are the conversations on brand? Right. Are they talking about themselves or are they talking about the patient? Is the patient laughing, giggling, and excited? Or is the patient kind of like, you know, where, where's the exit here? You know, <laughs> that's that's what you have to pay attention to. So right. it has to be an excellent experience, not just because you want great case acceptance, but because it's it's a huge multiplier on referrals. That opportunity that you have for that first month or so, that person is a new patient, primarily in the first couple of weeks, they will refer people faster and more frequently, more in more quantity than any other time. So you will see that. This family joins and that family joins. That family joins and these two families join, right? But you'll see it early. Yep. Eventually though, yes, of course, people will refer over time, but you're missing that exponential bump that happens on the front end like that. And it, this is, you can, you can find this, I'm sure if you just you know, Google when our people are more, most likely to refer to a business, it's immediately after they engage that business. By the way, it is also the time they are most likely to destroy a business online if That's they have true. a bad experience. They have a bad experience because they're, you know, they're hot and bothered about it. Like now's the time they're gonna go leave a bad review or they're gonna tell everybody, don't go there. It's what happened to me. Exactly. Right? So the new patient process is huge. By the way, once you have had a really good experience, one, two, three good experiences, if they have a bad experience, they'll forgive it. The first experience, you got no chance. It's it's right. all or nothing. Everything's on the table, right? By the fifth or tenth experience, if something is off, then they've got a relationship with you. They'll come and say, hey, you know what? Long-term employee who I know. You know, so-and-so that I interacted with, it's not quite like the other ones. Right. You know, something's a little off. Yeah. Patients routinely would say, you always hire great staff. You always hire great people. Yeah. We've heard that I don't know how many times, right? Tons. Tons. But you got to make that a process. And it's not just hiring great people. It's you got to grow them to be and stay great people, yeah. right? This is a good one. Actually, what is the importance of all team members to stay in their bubble during the day? And you're kind of leading from that into this. Okay. <clears throat> so that is the same question to ask a different way. Yeah. How do I keep, what is the importance of keeping people engaged in their mindset? Right? So that is the critical point of having a huddle. The huddle is about primarily engagement, energy of the team, right? Because people are coming to the office with all manner of baggage, right. with all manner of issues from home, especially now. Uh, you know, there are lots of stressful issues that we don't even know about in people's lives as a result of the pandemic and, and so on. Homeschooling is a stress on its own. Trust me, it's a whole other world, right? Um, you learn a lot about yourself <laughs> while you're teaching your child. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I love it. I, I enjoy doing it now. Uh, I, I actively do this. You know, I, I do the math and science with my daughter for um, half an hour in the morning. And she's, you know, she's flying through it, thankfully. But, um, you know, it's 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 not the easiest thing if you're trying to juggle kids at home or they're home, but they're not home. Then they're home, they're not home again. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And you really need to double down with your team right now, especially right. now, right? right? When things level out, okay, you know, we're back to normal-ish, but that's that's not here yet. Right. It's in some places it is. But in, uh, in Ontario, it's not. In lots of parts of Canada, it's not. So you really have to make sure we spend the time with the team to keep them or to reframe their mindset when they show up to the office to a patient service mindset, to a, okay, all my stuff at home is at home. I'm leaving it at home. T today, now, it's patient's practice team. That's what I care about. That's what I, where my head needs to be. And... You know, we're starting off on a, on a highlight. The only statistics we're looking at is how close we are to goal in certain things. Like we talked about that earlier, right? To, to um, create a, a friendly competition in the office kind of thing, gamify things a little bit. That's as far as we're going with numbers. Right. You know, maybe you might chat a little bit about, okay, if we have an um, emergency where we would stick them and that kind of thing. But usually that should be systemized. The team should just know that stuff. So, you know, the most important part of the huddle is the joke of the day because everyone laughs together. That's so true. <laughs> and I often would show up to huddles with something inspirational to say or something that I read or quote or something that I wanted to share with the team or just a reminder of what we're doing in the community or you know how proud I am of my team that they are doing what they are doing. Something, something. Just something to put a little bit of pride in them. Right. A little pride in their steps so that they could have that energy for the day that maybe they didn't show up with. Right. Now... 
we'll just never mind all the arguments about, you know, I pay them, they should just show up. They don't. Okay, people don't. People need re reset when they come in. It's a reset button when they come in. You know, you got to take them from wherever they are, slam the door on, the, on what they had on the way in and start anew in the office, right? And that will allow you to have the great new patient experience and all the things we talked about. Right. Yeah. Perfect. This is the last question that I have. So, and you're actually, you're really good at this. You still are. How did you keep a professional employer employee relationship with your entire team? And why is that so important? Yeah, that's really, that's a good question. That's mm -hmm. a good question. Well, you guys put some thought into these. Huh? <laughs> wow. I'm just really many questions. <laughs> so a professional relationship with your team. First of all, it's critical because as a business owner, people will come and go. And you will, if you get too emotionally involved with people, then you will take it personally when things don't go the way you want them to. You know, I thought we were friends. Why are you doing it this way? Why are you not listening when I told you to do that? Right? Instead, treat people as friends, but have a coach mentality more of a coach with a team not buddies going for beer you know what i mean right that's that's how i look at it we're not it's not it's not family it's you know i'm the coach and this is my team i care about them i really want them to grow and develop and be great at their thing because i know that they can i hired them to be that way Right. I made sure that we selected for the best people and I made sure that we put all the things in place for them to be successful. Now, I'm saying this because I know we have done that. If you haven't, then that's a prerequisite, right? right? But I don't like being friends with team members when they when then it gets turned around on you to say, oh, you know, we're, I, I don't have to do that, do I? Or I, you know, I'll get, I can get away with that. Oh, it's okay, right? And it's usually something that you know needs, you can't skip that, right? right. It's usually, the, the people will try to like, you know, play games like that. And, and you can't have that. Sometimes, so it all has to come back to your culture and your mission and be very, very clear about it. Mm -hmm. I never missed a meeting where I didn't say, we are all here for the patient's practice team best interest collectively, not one or the other, not right. mutually exclusive, all three. And my mission is to change the face of dentistry, which we are still working on, and primarily to do as much good for the community as we can, which we are still working on. Right. And I would always share those things so that people would look at me and not think, you know, oh, I can, he can give on that, or, you know, we don't have to do that, do we? I would always take it back to, well, you know, if we don't do well, then we can't do good things. We don't have anything left over, right? right? We give X percent to charities. We did 10% to, yeah. to help whatever we could. And we did so much stuff, which is phenomenal stuff. It's great. And I don't do it to pat myself on the back, but it was like, that's why we did what we did. Who needs the the large numbers? And what are you going to do with the money anyway? You can't take it with you, right? Right. But it was, it was a pride in that everything we did, people knew, you know, we're not just in it for the money, we care. Right. And so it set the framework for how we interacted with people. Now, if inevitably you have to discipline an employee or you have to like police them a little bit or you have to correct them, if they have the mistaken understanding that we're, we're buds and you can do whatever you want and I won't say anything now because we're, you know, we're friends. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So you can't, then it's awkward to have the conversation, right? It's like okay. team leaders. The reason why I don't want team leaders being HR people is because, well, how you're supposed to be friends with your team. You go out and hang out and your kids play together and then you're going to give one person heck at work for something that they're supposed to do they're not doing. It's a problem. Right. No one wants to be that person that's going to police their friend, right? That's that's not... So for team to be friends, great. The employer, no. And I don't want to know their gossip and their nonsense either, right? right? I don't want to know their personal business. Like, I, I have no problem being personable. 
they have kids, right? their kids' birthdays. That's great. I, that's, I'm happy to know. You know, I wish your kid a happy birthday and ask you about your vacation. That's great. But I can't have that get in the way of damaging the vision or the long-term success. Because inevitably what it does is it damages the relationship. Because as you grow and you change, expectations grow and change. Right. If a person falls into the category of, well, we're friends, so I'm just going to like sit on my rump now and do what I do. Um, yeah, I think that's why you and Era have lasted so long, right? Because you both have that sense of ability to be friends, but, you know, friends personally, but professionally, you know, we have that relationship squared away. Right. Right. So you have the ability to draw the line of what's what. Right. Some people are not as emotionally mature. Right. Right. Particularly newer employees, younger people. There's, there's, a, there's a disconnect there. So back to gossip. If the employer knows all the gossip about all the team members, that's a problem. You don't need to know that. You don't want to know that. It's taking you away from what you're supposed to be working on, right? Right. So, again, I, th I don't think it is um, detrimental to be friendly and personable with your employees, but coach relationship, not drinking buddies, right? Right. It also changes their respect level for you. I went to a course once when I was a brand new associate. Uh, you, you don't know about this because you weren't there, but... Um, this was, well, maybe you know about it, you might have heard about it because uh, you did start with us after that, where the whole team went, big team, uh, in a group practice, and, you know, the team was just, you know, some of them were out late and drinking and causing all kinds of ruckus, and then, you know, that was the kind of course that it was. Right. Um, I think it changes respect level for the employers if you behave that way. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain the same level of professionalism that you expect in the office if you want people to treat you that way. Right. If you want to command some authority, not that you need to like command authority, but I mean, you know, if you want to be respected as the employer and be taken seriously, you need to have some limits. Right. Period. That's that's as far as I'd go with that. Yeah. yeah. That's all I have. That's you. all you have? <laughs> that's it. That's all. <laughs> all right. Good. That's good. You got me off the hook. Uh, so that's, that's a great q and I, I don't know how long we ran, but if it's long, we'll cut it into two pieces. And um, I hope you enjoyed this. Now, for future Q&As, we might continue with this format. So if you like this and you have questions that we did not answer, and we covered a ton of stuff. I don't know if that was like 16 or 18 questions. Right? It seemed like a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything that you guys think of, having watched these, please let us know. Reach out to our team any way you have to contact us. Just send us a question or, or multiple questions if you have them and we'll tackle them in a future Q&A. So I hope you guys enjoyed this and found it useful. I hope you learned something. I know that you probably took some notes and if you're smart, you did. And um, yeah, I hope we tackled the most important questions in these, uh, in these segments. I'll see you guys in the next Q&A. And like I said, don't hesitate to reach out to us with your questions, all right? Have a great day. We'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Canadian Dentist Podcast. If you want to know how Dr. Biasucci tripled his practice in three years and cut his work week in half, request your free information kit at theelitepractice.com.